Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time of day it is. Um, I'm here to present to you and share with you parts three and four of Black Beauty. So that's uh, day two of our reading for year five and six. You might notice that uh, behind me, I'm actually uh, in school today. It feels very strange without you all here. It would be the first day of the summer term as I'm recording this on the Monday. Um, but this is what we have to follow for our safety. Um, I'm hoping you all will be back soon soon. Right, okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen to start with, and we're going to go through the inference questions from yesterday before I read the next chapter. Um, so, some of the questions yesterday, remember children, inference, it's when you're using clues to give you information, it doesn't explicitly tell you in the text exactly what happened, unlike um, the retrieval questions that you've been doing, this one you need to be like an investigator and find of clues. So the first question was, how do you know the horses had a nice life? Well, they were provided with good food, nice place to stay, so that word for that was lodgings, and they had a kind master. So it was clear they quite enjoyed their time. Additionally, they used to get to play together with the, the other colts. So it sounded like a pleasant life. Um, what impression do you get of the master and why? Uh, it actually said that quite clearly. He was a good, kind man who cared for the horses and the way he uh, treated Duchess, uh, our protagonist's mother, uh, was very clear and he petted uh, Darkie as he was known. Um, why were the dogs putting their noses to the ground on page three? Well that's because they had lost the scent, so dogs have an incredible sense of smell but they were trying to find that fox's scent that they'd lost so they would have had their noses close to the ground and sniffing away. Um, what did mother think of the hunt? Um, she couldn't understand why men liked it and she said this sport in inverted commas because she doesn't really think it's a sport um, and in the text you can see it says that horses get lost they tear up the fields so these are not good um, reasons for them to be doing that um, what troubled mother on page four so the one of the horses who fell unfortunately was shot dead so that is something that can happen children when they think they wouldn't be able to treat a horse then um, to stop them from feeling the pain they uh, they will actually um, kill the horse so that it no longer feels that pain so it's a quite a sad thing there and finally there was a quick language question um, which words tell that the dogs were moving quickly on page three well it was those words like burst and leaped and dashing these um, nice to verbs, powerful verbs that give you that impression of a rushed situation. Um, okay, moving on to the next chapter for today. A few um, words that come up today. There is a lot about um, sort of horse equipment, I suppose, or attire things they might wear. So you can see in this first picture here, horse with a chase affixed behind. Um, so that that's almost like a cart that would have been used um, for the horses to carry people along if they didn't want to sit them on their back. Um, you can see the bridle and the saddle. So the bridle going around the horse's head and the saddle where um, the man, woman or child would sit. Uh, there's a crupper there used uh, to attach it like around um, the, the horse's leg and also a horse's bit. So that gets explained. So that's a metal rod that goes through, uh, not through their mouth, sorry, rather in their mouth and it's fixed in there but you'll get to hear about that from uh, from darkie in a moment um some other words for you to see that come up that you might not have come up with before um so the first word is accustomed so you can say that after me accustomed accustomed so that has three syllables accustomed um and that is used uh, is a word that says someone is used to something. So the horse became used to having the saddle on his back, became accustomed to it. Um, second word is quite an old uh, phrase. So the word queer, which is a synonym for strange, really. It felt a bit strange or odd. Third word we're looking at is coaxed. So repeat that after me, coaxed. 
Okay, and coax is when you gently persuade someone to do something. So it's not a really forceful way. You'll just carefully say, oh, I think you should be able to do this. And you talk them through it. Um, and finally, a paddock. A paddock is a small field or enclosure where horses are kept. OK, so you'll be answering some of those retrieval questions. I'm going to go now to the PDF, which you can find in the description of this video. So if you want to follow, uh, read it yourself, then you can do so there. Um, and we'll read chapters and four. Chapter three, my breaking in. I was now beginning to grow. My coat had grown fine and soft and was bright black. I had one white foot and a pretty white white star on my forehead. I was thought very handsome. My master would not sell me till I was four years old. He said lads ought not to work like men and colts ought not to work like horses till they were quite grown up. When I was four years old, Squire Gordon came to look at me. He examined my eyes, my mouth and my legs. He felt them all down and then I had to walk and trot and gallop before him. He seemed to like me and when he has been well broken in, he will do very well. My master said he would break me in himself as he should not like me to be frightened or hurt. And he lost no time about it for the next day he began. Everyone may not know what breaking in is. Therefore, I will describe it. It means to teach a horse to wear a saddle and bridle and to carry on his back a man woman or child to go just the way they wish and to go quietly besides this he has to learn to wear a collar a crupper and a breeching and to stand still while they are put on they have to have a cart or a chaise fixed behind so that he cannot walk or trot without dragging it after him and he must go fast or slow just as his driver wishes he must never start at what he sees, nor speaks other horses, nor bites, nor kick, nor have any will of his own, but always do his master's will. That means what his master wants, even though he may be very tired or hungry. But the worst of all is, when his harness is once on, he may neither jump for joy nor lie down for weariness. So you see, this breaking in is a great thing. I had, of course, long been used to a halter and a headstall and to be led about in the fields and lanes quietly. But now I was to have a bit and bridle. My master gave me some oats as usual. And after a good deal of co coaxing, he got the bit into my mouth and the bridle fixed. But it was a nasty thing. Those who have never had a bit in their mouths can not think how bad it feels. A great piece of cold, hard steel as thick as a man's finger to be pushed into one's mouth, between one's teeth and over one tongue with the ends coming out at the corner of your mouth and held fast there by straps over your head under your throat round your nose and under your chin so that no way in the world can you get rid of a nasty hard thing it is very bad yes very bad at least i thought so but i knew my, my mother always wore one when she was out and all horses did when they were grown up and so what with the nice oats and what with my master's pats kind words and gentle ways, I got to wear my bit and bridle. Next came the saddle, but that was not half so bad. My master put it on my back very gently while old Daniel held my head. He then made the girths fast under my body, patting and talking to me all the time. Then I had a few oats, then a little leading about, and this he did every day till I began to look for the oats and the saddle. At length, one morning, my master got on my back and rode me round the meadow on the soft grass. It certainly did feel queer, but I must say I felt rather proud to carry my master. And as he continued to ride me a little every day, I soon became accustomed to it. The next unpleasant business was putting on the iron shoes. That too was very hard at first. 
My master went with me to the smith's forge to see that I was not hurt or got any fright. The blacksmith took my feet in his hand, one after the other, and cut away some of the hoof. It did not pain me. So I stood still on three legs till he had done them all. Then he took a piece of iron, the shape of my foot, and clapped it on and drove some nails through the shoe quite into my hoof so that the shoe was firmly on. My feet felt very stiff and heavy, but in time I got used to it. And now, having got so far, my master went on to break me to harness. There were more new things to wear. First, a stiff, heavy collar just on my neck and a bridle with great side pieces against my eyes called blinkers. And blinkers indeed they were, for I could not see on either side but only straight in front of me. Next, there was a small saddle with a nasty stiff strap that went right under my tail. That was the crupper. I hated the crupper. To have my long tail doubled up and poked through that strap was almost as bad as the bit. I never felt more like kicking, but of course, I could not kick such a good master. And so in time, I got used to everything. I could do my work as well as my mother. I must not forget to mention one part of my training, which I have always considered a very great advantage. My master sent me for a fortnight to a neighbouring farmer's who had a meadow which was skirted on one side by the railway. Here were some sheep and cows, and I was turned in among them. That means put in with them. I shall never forget the first train that ran by. I was feeding quietly near the pails, which separated the meadow from the railway, when I heard a a strange sound at a distance, and before I knew whence it came, with a rush and a clatter and a puffing out of smoke, a long black train of something flew by and was gone almost before I could draw my breath. I turned and galloped to the further side of the meadow as fast as I could, and there I stood snorting with astonishment and fear. In the course of the day, many other trains went by, some more slowly. These drew up at the station close by and sometimes made an awful shriek and groan before they stopped. I thought it very dreadful, but the cows went on eating very quietly and hardly raised their heads as the black frightful thing came puffing and grinding past. For the first few days, I could not feed in peace, but as I found that this terrible creature never came into the field or did me any harm, I began to disregard it, and very soon I cared as little about the passing of a train as the cows and Sheep. Since then, I have seen many horses much alarmed and restive at the sight or sound of a steam engine. But thanks to my good master's care, I am as fearless at railway stations as in my own stable. Now, if anyone wants to break in a young horse, well, that is the way. My master often drove me in double harness with my mother because she was steady and could teach me how to go better than a strange horse. She told me the better I behaved, the better I should be treated, and that it was wisest always to do my best to please my master. But, she said, there are a great many kinds of men. There are good, thoughtful men like our master, that any horse may be proud to serve. And there are bad, cruel men who never ought to have a horse or dog to call their own. Besides, there are a great many foolish men, vain, ignorant, and careless, who never trouble themselves to think. These spoil more horses than all, just for want of sense. They don't mean it, but they do it for all that. I, I hope you will fall into good hands, but a horse never knows who may buy him or who may drive him. It is all a chance for us, but still I say, do your best wherever it is and keep up your good name. Okay, that's the end of chapter three, where uh, the author really he explains that process of breaking in, so uh, Darkie is getting ready to be released from his home and away from his mother. Just take a sip of drink before we start chapter four. Chapter four, Birtwick Park. At this time, I used to stand in the stable and my coat was brushed every day till it shone like a rook's wing. It was early in May when there came a man from Squire Gordon's who took me away to the... My master said, Goodbye, Darkie. B 
be a good horse and always do your best. I could not say goodbye, so I put my nose into his hand. He patted me kindly and I left my first home. As I lived some years with Squire Gordon, I may as well tell something about the place. Squire Gordon's park skirted the village of Birtwick. It was entered by a large iron gate at which stood the first lodge. And then you trotted along a smooth road between clumps of large old trees. Then another lodge and another gate, which brought you to the house and the garden. Beyond this lay the home paddock, the old orchard and the stables. There was accommodation for many horses and carriages, but I need only describe the stable into which I was taken. This was very roomy, with four good stalls. A large swinging window opened into the yard, which made it pleasant and airy. The first stall was a large square one, shut in behind with a wooden gate. The others were common stalls, good stalls, but not nearly so large. It had a low rack for hay and a low manger for corn. It was called a loose box because the horse that was put into it was not tied up, but left loose to do as he liked. It is a great thing to have a loose box. Into this fine box the groom put me. It was clean, sweet and air. I never was in a better box than that. And the sides were not so high, but that I could see all that went on through the iron rails that were at the top. He gave me some very nice oats. He patted me, spoke kindly, and then went away. When I had eaten my corn, I looked around. In the stall next to mine stood a little fat grey pony with a thick mane and a tail, a very pretty head, and a pert little nose. I put my head up to the iron rails at the top of my box and said, how do you do? What is your name? He turned round as far as his halter would allow, held up his head and said, my name is Merrylegs. I am very handsome. I carry the young ladies on my back and sometimes I take our mistress out in the low. They think a great deal of me and so does James. Are you going to live next door to me in the box? I said, yes. Well then, he said, I hope you are good tempered. I do not like anyone next door who bites. Just then, a horse's head looked over from the stall beyond. The ears were laid back and the eye looked rather ill tempered. This was a tall chestnut mare with a long, handsome neck. She looked across to me and said, So it is you who have turned me out of my box. It is a very strange thing for a colt like you to come and turn a lady out of her home. I beg your pardon, I said. I have turned no one out. The man who brought me put me here, and I had nothing to do with it. And as to my being a colt, I am turned four years old, and am a grown-up horse. I never had words yet with horse or mare, and it is my wish to live at peace. Well, she said, we shall see. Of course, I do not want to have words with a young thing like you. I said no more. In the afternoon... When she went out, Merrylegs told me all about it. The thing is this, said Merrylegs, Ginger has a bad habit of biting and snapping. That is why they call her Ginger. And when she was in the loose box, she used to snap very much. One day she bit James in the arm and made it bleed. And so Miss Flora and Miss Jessie, who are very fond of me, were afraid to come into the stable. They used to bring me nice things to eat, an apple or a carrot or a piece of bread but after ginger stood in that box they dared not come and i miss them very much i hope they will now come again if you do not bite or i told him i never bit anything but grass hay and corn i could not think what pleasure ginger found it well i don't think she does find pleasure said merry legs it is just a bad habit she says no one was ever kind to her and why should she not why should she not bite Right. Of course, it is a very bad habit, but I'm sure, if all she says be true, she must have been very ill-used before she came here. John does all he can to please her, and James does all he can, and our master never uses a whip if a horse acts right, so I think she might be good-tempered here. You see, he said with a wise look, I am twelve years old, I know a great deal, and I can tell you there is not a better place for a horse all round the country than this. 
John is the best groom that ever was. He's been here 14 years and you never saw such a kind boy as James is. So that is all Ginger's own fault that she did not stay in that box. Okay, children, and that's the end of chapter four, where we learn uh, about uh, Darkie's move away from that home and to Squire Gordon's place. Um, Children, there's some retrieval questions for you to do here. So there's some um, that you can answer. And if you do it on a piece of paper, you could send it into the year five or the year six email address. If not, you can go on to Purple Mash and one of your to do's uh, for today will be the retrieval questions, most of them being uh, multiple choice, but there's a few single word ones that you need to put in there. Um, I suppose and it's probably worth talking about how maybe modeling how we would do one with retrieval um so maybe i could pick one at first um which is going to give you a bit of an idea um let's have a look okay so let's look at question four where it says what effect did the blinkers have on the horse so if I go back to um, my PDF, now blinkers was one of the words uh, that I thought this is um, an unfamiliar word. So if I was going to be retrieving here, uh, I would be looking for that word. So I'd probably scan. Now, I can remember from reading it that he spoke about the um, blinkers towards the end of describing the breaking in so let's see if i can find it okay so i'm just going to scan the text here that means i'm just going to read it through scan it sorry looking very quickly for a specific word blinkers beginning with b okay so i don't think it's in that one ah okay i can find it here now once we've found that word it's important to read before the word and after after the word. So first, a stiff, heavy collar just on my neck and the bridle with great side pieces against my eyes called blinkers. And blinkers indeed they were, for I could see not uh, on either side, but only straight in front of me. So when we go back to this, I look at the question, what effect did the blinkers have on the horse? What did it do to the horse? Well, I can see that they could not see on either side but only straight in front of me. So your answer could just be directly retrieved from there. Could not see on either side, but only straight in front of me. Remember, children, for a retrieval question, I wouldn't want a full sentence like the effect of the blinkers on the horse was just a quick fire answer like that. Um, OK, we're going to do some optional inference questions as well. Remember, you don't have to do that, but you can submit them to the group. Um, so question one. One, what evidence is there to show that the horse did not want to upset his master? Why didn't they want to upset the master? Uh, why do you think the author chooses to call the pony Merry Legs? What does this tell us about that particular character? Um, we did a bit of that on World Book Day, how um, authors carefully choose the, the names of certain characters. And finally, number three, at the top of page eight, what had happened to make Ginger ill-tempered? Um, Finally, an art one for today. Uh, there's more excellent description from Anna Saul in this, particularly in the first paragraph when she describes uh, um, what the horse looks like. So it's very handsome. So uh, it would be a great time to get a pencil, get a piece of paper and try and sketch uh, the horse, Darkie, that's been described in the first paragraph of chapter three. The description is there for you. OK, uh, I'm going to stop the video now. Looking forward to seeing some of uh, your work and answering all of your questions. Uh, have a good day. Take care. Bye.